God is good, and uh, football season is just around the corner. There, <laughs> someone else was excited over here. Come on, Shanae, the Niners are going to do well this year. Yes, they will. They're going to do very well. A um, couple things real quick before we dive into uh, some time in the Word. Um, missions trip. We love missions, man. And uh, so whether it's reaching out to folks right across the street from us, going up into the L's or our neighborhoods or down to the LA Dream Center, or perhaps all the way around the globe to India, we are all about touching people's lives. And uh, we got a great opportunity for our church family to join. Uh, spaces or availability is very limited. We can only take up to about eight to 10 people max. So if this is something that you uh, would enjoy doing, if you like it's the right time, it's the last week of October, first week of November. If you want to go to India with us, uh, no experience required, just a, a big heart to just uh, love on some people and to pray with people. That's, that's the requirement there. You can grab more information by where Pastor Keys is all the way in the guest services kiosk area over there immediately after the service. And uh, we've only got about uh, four more, more weeks to receive applications, and then we got to we got to go. We got to apply for all the visas and stuff. And then for uh, some of our college students um, who are still praying about their fall semester, our internship program is, uh, is just right around the corner here at City Life. We love training and equipping our young people. If you're done with high school and uh, whether you're 18 or whether you're 48, you can become an intern here at City Life. There's more information also at the kiosk in the back. And uh, it's going to be a fun season together. And uh, amen, I'm excited about the picnic next Sunday, and that's why we are shortening the service a bit next week so that the family can come, worship the Lord, and then go and fellowship and hang out with one another. Um, I am amazed at what God is doing here at City Life Church, hanging out with some friends last night in the Mission District, having some great food. I, I was just like pinching myself and saying, God, you keep con uh, connecting folks to our house from all over the Bay Area. There are people that come from the peninsula, North Bay, the East Bay, and they continue to come and join us on Sundays and throughout our activity. It's just crazy. Brother King, that's crazy right there. So next Sunday, it's just an opportunity for our church family to hang out together and get to meet some other folks casually, just chilling. If you're into sports, someone heard basketball, like, what, there's a basketball tournament? Yes, there is. And we're going to have some different competitions going on. All the pastors here, man, we love competition. And um, so we're going to have some softball tournament stuff and basketball, maybe some football, some Latino football, some yen. It's soccer for the Americans who uh, don't know what I'm talking about. The real football. But anyways, um, it's going to be fun. Great food, and uh, it's free, absolutely free. And uh, the park is literally, if you were to exit the building, it's like a block and a half that way. So you can take either side, uh, either Harrison or Folsom here, and uh, it's going to be a great time. So how many of you think it's a great idea that we do a church picnic like that? Who else thinks it's a great idea? How many of you are planning on attending next week? And all of our, our folks that work behind the scenes prepping the food and stuff, they're saying, amen, it's going to be a great time. Hey, inv invite friends. This is a great time for people to, to connect with the church family. And uh, some folks are a little uncomfortable to come into a church. I would. If I'm going to a place I've never been there before, it could be a little awkward and comfortable. And if you're a guest with us for the first or second or third time here, um, kind of what you see is what you get. We're just a bunch of average folks that uh, recognize that we need Jesus and uh, we love showing up and he keeps on helping us. And uh, so invite friends to a picnic. Sometimes a picnic opens the door for them to continue to connect with the church family. And it's, it's a good thing. Do you have your Bibles this morning? Bust out your iPhones, your Androids, your paper uh, Bibles, whatever you got with you. We're going all the way to the book of John in the New Testament. Talking to Pastor Keys and some of our leaders this last week. I'm always excited about what God's doing. I'm not, I'm not always excited how our football team might be doing or the baseball team might be doing or maybe even how we're doing. But I'm always excited about what God's doing. And uh, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm convinced of Level growing 
this life, growing in all these different areas of our lives because God has purpose for us to grow. He wants to cause us to blossom and to be fruitful and to multiply. And uh, it's barely there. He's not a God that rations out some blessings. He has more blessings than we can handle on any given day of the week. And uh, so he wants to see us grow. And uh, I'm excited for the word that God's already placed in my, my spirit and uh, for, for this next season. So prior to even engaging into that new series, um, this is kind of a setup sequence of messages for the next couple of weeks. How do we position ourselves then for the growth that God has for us? And that's what we're going to be talking about today and next Sunday and the Sunday after Pastor Eric Butler is with us, by the way, FYI, the brother can preach. If you haven't heard uh, the prophet Eric Butler, uh, just get, get ready because he can, he can preach, sing, rhyme, and prophesy all together. It's just, it's a crazy package. And uh, I've said it before, life just isn't fair. Some folks can just bring it and uh, he's going to bring it. So mark your calendars for about two weeks from now, Eric Butler in the house Saturday night and then Sunday, and it's going to be good. John chapter 15 is where we're at. If you have your Bibles, I'm reading from the NLT version. If you've been rolling with us for a little while, I grew up in a, in a old school Pentecostal church. So I grew up with King James version. <laughs> Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's all the thou's and thy's. And, and it, it took a while to kind of translate that into the New King James Version. And the last couple of years since we started ministering here in San Francisco, I felt like the Lord says, let's go with NLT for a season. It's just a little easier sometimes to read and understand. So if I trip up from time to time and I quote something like, wait a minute, I didn't see that on the screen. That's just my old school just kicking in. I'm the OG cat right here. All right, John chapter 15. Verses 1 through 8 is where we're at. It says this, I, this is Jesus talking, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener, and he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. Remain, again, the old school version says, abide in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit, if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Can you say Jesus? Jesus saying, you're not going to be successful unless you roll with this guy right here. If you remain in me and I remain in you, I'm going to produce some amazing things in and through you. Verse 5, yes, he kind of repeats this. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart, apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything that you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this, by the way, brings great glory to my father. When we produce good fruit, when we bring and bear good fruit, Papa upstairs is saying, I'm proud of that boy. I am proud of that girl. It pleases him. And we're going to explore that just a little bit. Socrates, old school Greek philosopher from way back in the day, had a couple of these laws that he communicated and articulated, one of which is to every cause there is a, an effect. So if there's an effect indirectly, that means that there is a cause. Something initiates something, which then produces something else. And then some other cat developed this law called to every action, there is a reaction or a counteraction. And uh, the idea with to every effect, there is a cause behind it. I like to incorporate that as say to every fruit, there is a root behind it. If there's no roots, there's no fruit. Actions and behavior are simply the reflection of an inward conviction or a condition in a person's life. How you behave and how you act is simply a reflection of really the true you on the inside. That's why we can, we can put a front from time to time and act a certain way. But really when the pressure comes on, y'all, what's on the inside <laughs> comes out. Sound effects are just bonus material this morning. I'm sure where that came from. And the Bible actually says that the mouth... It gives it away. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So if your heart is, well, anyways. Um, 
I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to help me today to pray and, uh, and preach. The, 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 the title for the message is The Root Cause. The Root Cause. Let me pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you that we get to hang out on a Sunday morning in the city with no traffic and it is well with our souls, God. Thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for the gathering of friends and family members. But more than all that, we want to. Reminded, God, that you are for us, God, and you've got things in store for us because of love. So we give you praise for that. In God's name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. I want to include all of our friends watching us online. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but um, City Life Church, we have an online community that tunes in and watches our services. They hang out and they worship. Last week we had communion. I said, grab yourself some juice in the fridge, whatever you got. It's, it's just, just join in with us. And they have and they do. So we want to welcome all of you watching us from around the globe. If you're in Brazil, boa tarde, boa noite, whatever time it is down there. And in Argentina, buenas noches. Um, for the Latino uh, hermanos and hermanas, uh, there was a missionary friend of mine that went to Mexico. And he was learning some Spanish. And he got in front of a big church and he says, buenas noches. And the pastor's like, what? Don't say that in church. And it's buenas noches. When it's not just it's like nice behind, and that's not good. I'm just saying. So learn your learn your, your learn your greetings. And Nippon konnichiwa. And I'm going to stop right there. Um, let's kind of interact just a little bit. Help a brother out for just a few seconds. I want you to when you hear the name or the word that I that I kind of dish out your way. I want you to. Speak out loud and give me one word that comes to your mind when I throw out these names. Are you ready for this? And you can interact with the preacher. It's all right. So when I say something like Michael Jackson, Thriller Music, Jackson 5, what else? Glove, a fro, what else? Smooth. What? A Jerry what? <laughs> all right, let's try another one. Let's try another one, all right? Because again, when we think of someone, we hear these, these, these names, what comes to your mind? When I say Miley Cyrus, what, what do you think of? Someone said twerk, trouble, wrecking ball, what else? S lipstick, turn the channel off, that's good. When I, <laughs> too much money, spoil bread, excuse me, Lord, help people, save her, Lord Jesus. She, used to, she grew up in church. Lord, bring her back to church. Help her. Um, how about this? Let's kind of, let's talk about, how about this name? Joan Rivers. Someone says stretched. It's a stretch. Makeup. Plastic surgery. Lots of money. Plastic, Elizabeth says. Yeah. How about, let's, let's shake it up a, a little differently. How about 9-11? Sad, tragic, someone said Porsche Carrera. That's a car, Porsche Carrera 911, but all right, who else? It provokes different reactions, notice, right? How about the king, that is the wannabe king, Mr. LeBron James? Shoes, Elvis the king, who else? Wannabe Jordan, champion. A goat, a scapegoat, or a goat. If you're Miami Heat fans, they're going through intercession right now. Lord Jesus, help them. How about Kim Kardashian? <laughs> that takes the pie today. A collective. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray blessed over all those names that we just mentioned. Save them, Lord Jesus. Here's the point, though. The names provoke certain things. Why? Because we see the exterior. We look at their legacy, some of which are good, some of which the reputation isn't so great. A lot of it is a facade. It's maybe plasticky on the exterior. But oftentimes the true person isn't really revealed to its truest sense. However, the reputation or the legacy continues to roll with that person. The Bible is very clear about people. And uh, for example, in Matthew chapter 12, 33, it says that a tree is identified by its fruit. And the, sim the symbolism there is that a tree is equated to a person. 
So a person is identified by its fruit. If a tree or a person is good, its fruit will be good. If that tree is bad, the fruit's going to be bad. Another passage in Matthew 7, 17 and 18, it says, a, a good tree produces good fruit, and the bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree just simply can't produce good fruit. No matter how hard you try, if, it's, if the inside is bad, if the root system is bad, you might tape up and hang some fake fruit that you picked up from the grocery store, but that fruit is going to shrivel up real quick. Whatever is on the inside, whatever the root system is of that person or individual, eventually that will on. Wow, that's, that's hypocritical right there. Again, just last night hanging out with some friends and my wife and I, when we were um, uh, college students, Bible college students back in the day, and if you're single, we recommend Portland Bridal College. <laughs> um, <laughs> internship program, and the, anyways. So we were, um, we had to pay our bills and we had to pay for, for our schooling and our rent and our food. So I, I used to serve tables. If you feel like you're called to be a pastor or you're involved in ministry somehow, work at a restaurant. That'll prep you quicker than Bible college. Serving people with attitudes. I'm going to send this back because I'm like, or the picky people where they come and they look at the menu and they always have to alter the order. If it's a mushroom burger with onions, they say, I like the mushrooms. Burger, but you know, they always change it up and they're complicated. So I remember just being a waiter and having to wait on people with the motivation that if I'm really, really nice and I provide excellent service, they're going to tip me good. <laughs> Wake up, buddy. <laughs> and uh, so I remember us talking about that and how in serving people, it's like you just never know what you're going to get. And the most difficult people to serve. The second most difficult group to serve were the young people. Because they're, they di they're flat out broke. They got enough money to get there, buy their burger, and share it with everybody. And get free refills on their soda. Up in the Northwest, they call it pop. Get free refills on pop and their fries. And so I understand. But the most difficult group for us were the Christians. They would come. Many of them would come right after church. <laughs> So they're coming, they're still talking about the service. Oh, do you see that lady's hair? Oh my gosh, she is just so ugly that way. The gossip session. Oh, that's a small group. I'm sorry, that's what it was. Uh, and they would roast the pastor and everything else and criticize. And these are the Christians. And they would talk about church and all of us wait staff people, servers, the bus boys, the hostesses, everybody would walk. We could hear what they're talking about. When you go to a restaurant, don't be eluded or thinking that people around you don't hear what you're talking about. They do. And, and we would listen, and, we, and then they would grab their hands to pray. Oh, snap, right there. They, they pray. They bless their food. And then when it was all said and done, they'd pay the bill after many complaints and redos and whatever. Then they leave, and most of the times, they wouldn't leave a tip. Nobody wanted to serve these folks. Like, what, am I working for free now? Waiters and waitresses, they, they make less than minimum wage because there's an expectation that a tip is going to be left. And the hypocrisy talking about, oh, it's so good to be here and man, God bless you or whatever. And then leaving, see, actions speak much louder than words. I got real quiet in here, snap. Sorry, y'all. Maybe the Holy Spirit's convicting a few of us. <laughs> and one time this lady actually left a track on the table. For those of you who are kind of new to this journey with Jesus, a track is like a little booklet talking about why you need Jesus. And uh, finally, so that's it. Something just inside of me said, that's, that's just not going to fly. I was young. I had hair back in the day. Didn't fully understand the complexity of life and management. I took my apron off. I went to the back, you know, parking lot. And I said, man, let me talk to you. I got a problem here. Um, thank you for the track. I'm a Bible college student. I love Jesus with all my heart. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Um, thank you. Um, except um, the problem is that I need to pay my school bill. I need to buy books and I need to pay my rent. And this track isn't helping at all. Oh, I'm so sorry. So they took a Pentecostal offering right there. She, someone took a hat and they passed the collection bucket around and they gave me a tip, an offering. 
See, actions speak louder than words. Why is it that the world listens and watches the Christians and they go, yeah, I don't want to associate with those people because they're such hypocrites. Because the truth is, in many cases, we are. What is the reputation that we have? Jesus, in my opinion, is, ex is extremely compelling. His message is always a positive one. The gospel simply means good news. Jesus is not a hater. He's not a one, a person that's pointing the finger at people and saying, you really are messed up. Look at you. That's not who Jesus is. And yet the church makes it so stinking complicated. And we, we talk a certain way and we do certain things and the world says, yeah, whatever you want. I, I don't want that right there. So we got to get, we, we got to help some folks look beyond just people and actually find Jesus. Because Jesus says, if you hang out with me, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you're going to bear, bear good fruit. Not just fruit, but good fruit. So let's explore this just a little bit more. If you're taking notes, uh, your actions, your fruit are a reflection of the person inside of you. Your action, what you do is a reflection of the true person on the inside of you. And I like to say this, what we do in church oftentimes doesn't match up what we do on Monday at work or at home or with family members. What's on the inside, by the way, will come out. Three things that I learned from John chapter 15. I'm going to share a couple of thoughts with you. We're going to bounce through scriptures a little bit here. Three thoughts that jump out to me from just this portion right here. In uh, verse 5, it says, yes, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce, another word there is, bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can't do anything. And what he means with that is anything that is good. You can do stuff, but you won't do anything that is actually good. Some days we have some good moments, and then most days we're like, man... Like Britney Spears would sing back in the day, oops, I did it again. And we, we make these mistakes, and it's like, what was I thinking? Let's explore the Old Testament for just a little bit in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in the, in the Old Testament. By the way, it's the, most, uh, it's the book with the most messianic prophecies of all of the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah points a picture of Jesus hundreds of years before Jesus even was born into this world. And it describes him from, from him being, uh, uh, being led to be crucified and the beating that he was going to receive from the Romans, all these different things. There's all these what we call messianic verses in, in the book of Isaiah. So let me just show you a couple because what I want to, what I, I want to encourage you to see is this. Jesus says, I'm the vine. You are the branches. Now, a vine is a little different from just a tree with a big old trunk. If we go up to Napa, uh, there's all the vineyards up there. The vine and the root are one and the same. The vine is embedded into the ground, and it comes from the ground, and then it produces branches. And it goes over the walls, and it spreads out. Jesus says, I am the vine. In other words, I am the root, and you are the branches. And in their culture, in the context of wine and vineyards, it was, it was a topic that was extremely familiar. They were, very, they were very cognizant of what he was talking about. They understood. So not only is he the vine, but he is the root system as well. And the winds would blow, and if the vine wasn't firmly grounded or rooted, it would have been blown away. So vines were actually difficult to uproot because the rooting system was very, very sturdy, very strong. Now watch that connection when we go to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, because he says, and I'm using the New King James Version to help me out here. It says, there shall come forth, this is prophetic, speaking of things to come, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Notice, there shall come forth a rod, capital R, recognizing whenever you're studying God or Jesus in the Bible, the, the, the writers capitalize the letter when it's speaking of him. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of, its, of his uh, roots. So there's a connection, the rod, which is the stem and the root system, and the branches. I'll help you out in a few seconds. Isaiah 11, 10, it says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Some of you guys are like, what the heck is Jesse? Jesse was the dad, the father of one of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament, that is David. David's dad, his name was Jesse. And there's all these different prophecies about Jesus coming from the bloodline, the lineage of King David. So from the root of Jesse, that is David, who shall stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles shall, shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. And then Isaiah 53 verse 2, my servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. And there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. 
See, the Bible talks about Jesus as being an average carpenter kid. There was nothing glorious about him. He didn't look like Fabio. Dude, look at that guy, long hair. Just an average dude. Would have never made it to the cover of GQ. Never. It's like never won the popularity contest. Jesus was an average guy that if you looked amongst the crowd, it's like, where's the leader? The Messiah? Just a bunch of normal average. That was Jesus, an ordinary guy. And Isaiah is describing him from hundreds of years prior, but coming as one who came from the root of David. Watch this, Revelations 5.5. 5. Now we travel to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 5.5. 5. But one of the elders said to me, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Speaking again of Jesus, referring to him as the root of David. Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. And I am both the source, that is the root of David, and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. That's why Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher. Jesus is both the source and the heir. Come on, somebody. He is the root system, and he's the one who generates the branches. Jesus says, uh, uh, last week we were having communion, and we're talking about taking Jesus into us. The communion is symbolic of Jesus living through us. We become his uh, outstretched hands. We become his spokespersons. We become his feet that take the good news everywhere we go. So he is the root system and he is the branches even through us. So grounded and rooted. Here's the point. Number one is that Jesus is the root. He is the vine. In your, if your life was a tree, who are you rooted in? Who are you grounded in? What is your terra firma? What is it that, that solidifies you? Where do you draw your source of life from? I like to encourage us all. Jesus needs to be our source of life. If we're going to produce good fruit on a consistent basis, we better have some good roots. Now, what's crazy is that in our life, life is about decisions and choices. We can have some good moments, and then we could have some boneheaded moments, and that happens to me all the time. And I married a gracious wife who just puts up with this crazy guy, and I, 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 you know, I have my share of mistakes on a regular basis. So there are some moments where things are good, and then others, it's like I've created certain roots in my own life. They're, they're not of Jesus, and it, I will default to them from time to time. And I need to bring that to him and say, Lord, I... I don't want just the actions and the behaviors and even the thoughts to even come from that. But God, I need you to help me go to the root system. I want to eliminate that. It's not good enough just to put a band-aid on the areas where we make mistakes. God, I need you to change me. And, and check this out. It doesn't matter if you go to seminary or Bible college, all kinds of training. Even on your best day, you can't change yourself. <laughs> we can't. Why do we try to change other people? Isn't that crazy? I got I to gotta talk to her. And it's like, no you, no, you don't. If you can't change yourself, you're not going to be able to change someone else. But God can help us change. Because he is the author. He is the master architect, the head engineer, the lead engineer. He says, I know exactly how I wired this person. Some wires got messed up over here. Their childhood, mama did some stupid things. Dad was a knucklehead and they got dropped on their head. Let's fix it. And uh, whatever the excuse might be, God who understands everything. He can, he can change us. He can eliminate these roots, but it requires, it requires our cooperation. It requires us saying, God, I recognize that this root system over here, though there's some good ones on this side, on this side over here, this is not like you. I need you to, to help me change. It's funny how within one stream, there can be two types of water, good water and bad water. And God is wanting to purify us. He's wanting to change us. And we got to just be surrendered to him. From this portion of, of John uh, 15 here, Jesus is the root system. He is the vine. He's the one that we find and derive our source of life from. Then the next portion here, it comes from verse 4 because he says, Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce or bear fruit if it, if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. That word right there, um, produce. Uh, it's a poorly translated word because the true word in the Greek is it has more to do with bearing to bear something and the idea of Bearing something means to carry like you're carrying a backpack or a jug of water You are carrying or bearing something It's not just that you like oh, I had a really good moment right now And you produce fruit Pablo, I don't know where that sound keeps coming from man. I 
Help me, Jesus. Anyways, um, we, the, the fact of the matter is this. When it comes to spiritual fruit, we don't produce it. God is the one who produces it. That's why it's called the fruit of the spirit. We don't produce that. Today, I'm just believing for just apples of love. <laughs> Whatever he chooses to produce, our job or our responsibility is to carry it. More specifically, the beauty of this word here in the Greek is not only does it mean to carry, but it means to display or to showcase or to give to others so that they can partake of. That's why when we say taste and see that the Lord is good. What is the author talking about? When we carry the fruit of God and we're bearing it, other people can partake of it and they're blessed. It's like, man, I enjoy being around that person. Every time I get around that brother or that sister, I just feel more encouraged when I leave. And the opposite could be said by some others as well. Every time you get around certain people, you're just like, uh, after just a few minutes, I got to go home and shower. E, get off of me. Uh, whatever that negativity is. Uh. It's like, man, it's like you only have enough grace for a few moments. Have you met it? Don't raise your hand. You might be sitting next to one right now. But <laughs> some people, it's like you can only endure for a few moments, right? Whereas others, it's like you can hang out with them. And every time they just cheer you up. They just, without having to tell you a bunch of stories, it's just who they are. That's some good fruit right there. A couple weeks ago, I, uh, I got an email from Walmart. Um, here in the city, there is no Walmart. <laughs> uh, there is one Costco that, that, that services almost a million people. There is no Walmart around. So living where I live, it's like there's no Walmart. And, but I got this email and it says, now we deliver fresh produce. So I'm like, how, how, <laughs> how fresh can produce be in Pacifica? You know? <laughs> I'm going to fog. I mean, potatoes might grow there. I don't know. Um, I, I'm going to try it. And it's organic, y'all. Nicole, if you're watching, you would have been proud, man. Just organic fruit and produce. And so it's like if you order the first time, it's free delivery. And, and we'll throw in a discount to hook it up. I'm like, all right. So I'm just scrolling through this stuff. It was a bad moment because I was already hungry. Rule of thumb is don't go shopping when you're already hungry. You know, eat before you shop or else you buy out the store. You, you all know that. But I just, it, it caught me at the wrong time. You know, I just scrolling through and all of these different fruits and stuff like, that looks amazing. So avocado and tomatoes and dude, it's like I bought out Walmart. And so the truck shows up and uh, I wanted these, these plums, apricot plum looking things. And the pictures, they looked amazing, juicy and red and organic. So, you know, it's going to be good. No extra food coloring or whatever. Um, so anyways, I, uh, I come home and there's all these bags of fresh produce. And I'm like, brother's hungry. I grab three of them. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to eat healthy. So I take a big old bite of this juicy. It looked gorgeous. It was beautiful. It was big. Big old thing. I'm like, come on, Walmart. Y'all are like really big. Everything you do, look at that. It's huge. And I took this big old juicy bite. <sighs> juice just like running down the chin. I'm like, mm -hmm. I start chewing on it. It looked good. It was juicy. It was cold, but it was not sweet. Uh-huh. Then I took another bite. Uh -huh. What is wrong with you, man? I, ended, I, I, I could understand Jesus walking up that fig tree and said, what is wrong with you? Where's your fruit? I took another bite. It's like, this ain't working. Maybe I just got a bad one. Out of all the ones that Walmart sent me, there's a bad one. I grabbed the other one that I have. <clears throat> another big bite. Juice coming down. Luscious. Tasteless. Oh, what a waste of time and money. It looked good. It felt good. It just didn't taste good. There's a lot of folks that know how to play Christianese real good. You look real good on the outside. Oh, snap. <laughs> Did I have to go? Oh, that's called a setup, y'all. You look good. You talk good. You hang out with the person, and for a moment, you just kind of feel good, like, shh. But then there's just no positive, lasting flavor. What kind of fruit are we bearing? How do we fix it? We'll go back to the source. See, because the idea, again, is we're called to bear much fruit, not just some fruit, but much fruit. We're called to display God's good fruit. 
And, and, and Jesus wants to. He wants to showcase his goodness through us. Oftentimes we allow other types of fruit to come out attitudes and different things but he says let's kind of like 86 those bad ones and let's display my fruit because it's always good people don't need religion y'all we don't need it your co-workers don't need it your family members don't need it people don't need religion they just need to realize who Jesus really is the whole religious thing in itself is empty and that's why they, they leave and it's like it's like they ate a big old bag of pirate booty it's like it kind of tastes good for a minute but there's just no substance to it you're full, but there's just like no, no life, no nutrients. Some of y'all, I think it's because it's new and I keep talking about food. People are getting hungry here. <laughs> so that word, uh, for a branch cannot bear fruit if it's severed from the vine. It can't display the fruit if you're not connected to Jesus. You can't display his fruit if you're not directly linked up to him. And the cool thing is God never looked for perfect people. He's not looking for a branch that has no blemish, no little faults. He's just looking for available branches that says, Jesus, I'm going to connect to you. And we connect. And then he begins to bring life again. Some of our leaves, and I look around, I may not know your story. God does. And your leaves currently are all withered. You're not living a fruitful life. But God wants to include you in his life-giving plans and purposes. It says, if you connect with me, I will help you. And your life will begin to have some color again and fruitfulness again. Another word that jumped out to me from that verse is that word remain or the word abide. That word is very, uh, very important because that word in the Greek means to stay or to stick through difficult times. When you remain or abide in him and you stick to him, you stay with him through tough times, your fruit becomes sweeter. See, there's a lot of folks that throw in the towel real quick. If you go up to Napa, and I had the privilege of meeting a guy who, who like, was like the top director for one of, their, one of the prestigious uh, vineyards up in Napa, Sonoma County up there. He was talking to us about the different types of grapes and the process of how they, they crush the rapes and, excuse me, crush the rapes, that'd be real terrible. Crush the grapes. Help us, Jesus. Crush the grapes. They barrel the grapes. All the, the whole process that comes with it. And he talked about the different types of grapes and where they grow. The reason that California has some of the best wine in all of the U.S. is because of the condition of the elements in that region. It's windy up there. California, you got the sun that will beat down on you. You got the wind. You got all these different conditions. And yet the grapes there that are produced, they're really good. I'm not a wine specialist, so I'm not going to try to pretend like I know all the names. Pinot Noir, Merlot, Cabernet. Some of you got, oh, yeah, that's good. That's, that's, you're like naming me all these different characteristics. I couldn't tell you all the characteristics. But the guy explained to me that the grapes that grow on the sides of the, the hills, if you will, they're the ones that are the most resilient because they have to endure the toughest of the challenges of the elements around them. They're the ones that produce the best wine. To remain in Jesus means that you stick with him even through the most difficult and trying times of life. And as you've walked through the fire, as you've navigated through the floods of life, there's a product that is produced on the other side, a fruit of his spirit that is sweeter through you. Some of us, we want just the conventional, convenient, comfortable ride with God. And the fruit that is produced is good, but there's some great fruit that can be produced. So when you have testings or trials, as Pastor Keys was even alluding to last week, take it easy. Understand that if you lean into him, he's going to pick you up and he's going to form something beautiful through you. You might look around in your own life right now and say, things aren't looking so good. My relationships... It's like one of those country songs. You know what I'm saying? You know what happens when you play a country song backwards? You get your girlfriend back. You get your truck back. You get your dog back. You get your beer back. You get it all back. <laughs> Thank you for the courtesy laugh. Thank you all. You're all amazing. <laughs> Some of us, it's like we could write that story. We could be the inspiration to a lot of those sad songs because we look around. It's like, where is the good fruit? Can I encourage some people here today that God is the source of good fruit 
If we will just lean on him, if we'll remain in him, if we'll abide in him, if we'll stick with him, he will produce something good. Even through your trials right now, even through your tests right now, he is doing, he is forming, he's producing something that will be sweet, something that will bring him pleasure, something that the world will taste of and say, man, God is good. If he can do that for you, he can perhaps do it for me as well. Don't quit. Don't jump the boat. Don't throw the towel. Allow the fruit to be perfected and performed in and through you. Watch what the Lord's going to do. Some of you need to hear that today. Marriages, relationships. Someone once said that marriage is spelled with a four-letter word. Starts with a W, y'all. W-O-R-K. It's work. Mar marriage is work. Some of you guys are dating like, man, she's cute. Oh, he's handsome. I'm just... FYI, when it's all said and done, W-O-R-K. But it's worth it. It's worth it. And you got you to gotta stick together. You got to stay together. You got to abide. Oh, come on, somebody. When it comes to the things of God, sometimes things just get tough. And people are like, that's it. I'm going back to the world. Did you forget where you came from? Jesus was so good, and now things aren't working the way you had hoped or planned. And it's like, man, I'm going to go back to Egypt. Ah, Egypt, man, those days, those parties were good. Yeah, but you forget how people treated you. They didn't have good motives. We're, we're, we're oftentimes blindsided and we're short-sighted. We forget how bad it used to be. Just because things aren't perfect right now, it doesn't mean that it used to be better. God is just perfecting some good fruit. I need to encourage somebody here today. Remain in him. Remain in him. Abide in him. <laughs> ah, um, one of my sons, I won't mention his name, but recently he's big time into basketball. And it's like, dude, he is like watching basketball all day and bouncing the ball behind his back. And I already hired Shadeh. I said, Shadeh, I need a coach. Teach the, teach the boy how to dribble and... I won't mention his name, but he's, he's all into basketball right now. And his cousin is down from Bible college for the summer, and they play video games. And I remember just kind of going down there, and I used to be all right. Madden, 1996, I did okay. <laughs> you know, but um, they're, they're playing video game basketball, and the kid is, like, learning all these different names of players and all the bench players. I'm like, dude. But, but I came down, I was watching the big cousin playing with the younger cousin. The big cousin's 23, the younger cousin is, was seven, he's now eight, and they're playing, and the older cousin has much more experience. So he would keep the boy in the game long enough to keep it kind of interesting, but every now and then you just can't help but make some good baskets. And my son would get so frustrated, he's like, I'm so tired of this. He's already losing by 10 points. You know what he would do? Stop, reset, start over. I'm like, dude, dude, that's just not even right. I've been playing for several minutes. That's it. Pause, restart, and the game starts again. So it's zero to zero. They start again moments later. Oh, dang it. Takes after his mom that way, you know, and just his temper, his personality, it's just it's crazy. Like, son, you should pray more. But he wants to reset the button again. Things aren't going his way. His cousin is whooping on him again. What is wrong with Steph Curry? He always makes those threes, man. And he throws his controller down. And again, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Doesn't that just feel like church? <laughs> it feels as though we're kind of trailing by a few points. And all of a sudden, that's it. I'm just done with this whole church thing and God thing and church people. <clears throat> and we quit. What kind of fruit is being produced then? See, we have to endure. We have to abide. We have to remain. We got to stick together. That's what Jesus is teaching us right here. Galatians 5, it says, but the Holy Spirit, he produces this kind of fruit, not like what the world produces, but he produces in our lives fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. There is no law against these things. That's the kind of fruit that the Holy Spirit wants to produce through us if we're remaining in him. You never produce the fruit of the Spirit. You simply carry it. You simply carry it. I'll give you one more quick story here. We were in SoCal on vacation. <laughs> and again, it's, it's crazy because we're all in a journey of God helping us. I'm, 
I'm one of the pastors here at the church, but I'm, I'm going through the school myself. I, I, I need the Holy Spirit to help me. Lord, I'm, 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 I'm hoping to learn from my mistakes. I don't want to make the same mistakes again and again and again and again. Lord, help me. <laughs> So I'll use myself as the example. I'm in SoCal. It's vacation. We just had a great, a great week. Things are good. And um, it's time for us to leave because I want to drive back to, to SF because I need to watch the Brazil game World Cup. I need to watch it at home. That, that's, that's, that's it. So, like, we're going to drive. We're going to beat the traffic. Um, and we're going to go. So we loaded the kids up in the car and all of our stuff. And when you got four kids, you got stuff. And when you pack to go on vacation, it's always different coming back. There's always, like, stuff everywhere. Parents know what I'm talking about? So I had to get, like, one of those luggage things to go on top of the car because there's just no space in the car whatsoever for our stuff. Blow up little floaties. And it's, just, it's just crazy. I'm talking about Elena's stuff. I didn't talk about the kids' stuff. Um, just kidding. I love you, babe. So it's like, man, we, we were staying at this, this, this place, this hotel place, and the car, we were in the basement. That was, that's where the parking was at. And it's kind of a little dark down there and um, stuffy, man, really hot. Almost as hot, not as bad as the East Bay, but pretty hot. Um, and we're down there. And um, I'm loaded, and it's like I am sweating, and I'm trying to strap the stuff on top. And <sighs> the kids are inside. They're listening to their music. It's air conditioned in the car. And I'm just like sweating like a dog out there, man. It's crazy. And I'm trying to get this thing to work. And <sighs> come on, let's go, let's go. And I just can't get this thing. So I'm frustrated. It's like, come on, let's just hit the road. I'm already running at least two minutes late. It's like, come on, dude. And. So, so it's, it's a garage, right? A basement garage kind of a thing where you drive down, and then there's a bunch of spots for people to park at, right? I have my doors open. I'm on top of the car trying to, like, strap this thing down, and all of a sudden, a little car comes up with this precious woman and her kids, drives up, puts her blinkers on in a garage parking. Blinkers. Out of all the other parking stalls available, she wants to park right next to mine where the doors are open. So she pulls the car halfway there and just kind of stops and stares at me. I'm on top of the car sweating. It's a true story. And then I gave her that look. I didn't have to say much, just the look. <laughs> I, I didn't have to say a whole lot, but just that look. <laughs> that look. I don't think most of you have ever seen that look, but there's that look. And the lady's just kind of like. And then out of my mouth, and I said it very sweetly, ma'am, there's a lot of open spots everywhere. <laughs> and I was very sweet when I said it. You know what she said? You don't have to be rude about it. Oh, man. And I'm like, and then right then and there, that little voice, and you call yourself a pastor? I said, I'm in Los Angeles. She doesn't even know me. Who cares? Get out of here. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. She'll never come to our church. Who cares? If you're watching us online, if you're watching us online, I love you, lady. <laughs> just never know. You never know. I caught the hint, and I walked over to her, and I'm sweating and stuff, and she's got these kids, and they're looking at me, and I like that old, mean guy, and I just said, you know what, ma'am, I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry, and then she thought I was joking, you are rude, I said, I know, I'm so sorry, please, and then, it's like I tell my kids, not only say you're sorry, but then ask them, will you please forgive me, I did, I'm so sorry, will you please forgive me, and she's like, Oh, heck no. And she used the full version, King James status right there. I said, well, you got to do what you got to do. And I walked away. I finished packing. Let's get out of here. True story. What that picture was, it's like there's, there's still some fruit that isn't of the Holy Spirit that from time to time, that self-control fruit, mm -mm, it wasn't there. That patience, it definitely wasn't there right there. There's stuff that is produced. And the Holy Spirit kept on reminding me, you got to... 
you guys spend more time with me. Vacation was good. Spend more time with me. We're all in this journey together, y'all. God's at work within all of us. The fact is, he's the root system, we're the branches. But we can't bear good fruit unless we're connected to him. And then the final thought comes from John 15, verse 1. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. Now, that is a real poor translation of that word as well. From the original language, that word gardener is more than a gardener. Because a gardener, usually it's someone that you hire to help work in the garden. That word in the Greek says, he owns the vineyard. So <laughs> I'm the true uh, vine or the grapevine, and my dad, he's the owner here. He owns it all. That's what Jesus is saying. The gardener or the vine dresser, the owner, he comes and he prunes, and he does, he does the work of the owner because he cares about his product. Verse 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, Jesus says, and this brings great glory to the Father. When you remain in Jesus, then the owner looks and he says, this is real good. And much like that passage in Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus gets baptized, he comes out of the water. All of a sudden, it's like the full deity of God is displayed at one place at one time. It's like a dove comes from heaven. That's how I picture doves flying. That's a picture of the Holy Spirit. And he descends and rests upon Jesus. And then a voice from heaven says, this is my son who I love. And in him, I'm well pleased. I like my boy right there. That's kind of the same thought that when I read this right here, when we remain in Jesus and he produces his fruit through us, we glorify God the Father and the Father looks and he says, well done, well done. Well done, servants. Well done, sons and daughters. Well done. That's my baby right here. I, this is my, my prized possession right here. It is well with my soul. I like this. That's the, that's the affirmation that we receive from God the Father. I've got so much more to share, and maybe I'll just kind of park some of this for next week. The point here is that Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. God is the gardener, the owner. He owns us already. It's not like we're doing him a favor. We already belong to him. His goal and his motivation is to see that which he owns producing good fruit, fruit that looks like him, fruit that reflects his character and nature, fruit that is like, wow, this is like heaven food. That's the kind of fruit that he wants to produce. As I have some of our worship team members come to the front, come to the platform today, I think the encouragement that I believe God has for us is this. If we were to look at the fruit of our lives, what is being produced? What are the telltale signs? Who are we rooted in? The question isn't what are we rooted in, but who are we rooted in? Because the fruit gives it away. Stuart, Back in the day, one of my interns years ago taught me how to play Texas Hold'em. And it was more than, than just the cards, but Stuart is a very sharp guy. He's like, PJJ, it's not just the cards. You're playing with everybody's cards. And your face and the way you play, that's a big portion of how you play. It's not just the cards that you have in your hand. It's the person. It's, it's just, it's how you roll. Sometimes you just got to shake it up a little bit. Just change your pattern so that you don't become predictable. But he says, because the novice players, they, they're, they're going to give you some telltale signs. You're going to know when they have a bad hand and you're going to know when they have a good hand. Like the vein start, starts popping on their, their neck. They got pocket aces, man. It's like, so he began to instruct me. He says, you got to read people. You got, you got to follow their, their behavior, their patterns. When it comes to our lives, our actions, they are a telltale sign of really what goes on in the inside. When things are good, we have a certain way of doing things and living. When things aren't going so good, what is being produced? I don't know about you, but I, I want to be one that produces and bears and displays more of God's fruit, not my own fruit. I'm hoping that my shriveled up prunes and raisins or whatever that are produced from the flesh that they just go away man i want i want god's fruit to be displayed in and through me if you're not kind of sure what kind of fruit you're producing just make a decision today jesus i choose you you may not fully understand everything and how that all plays out but jesus i want to give you a shot i choose you if your word is true that you're going to produce good things through me i want to give you a shot if you would stand to your feet with me this morning
many of you know that God has enough good fruit to go around? He wants to hook it up that way. He wants to use us to be blessed. By us remaining in Him, we are blessed. By us remaining in Him, we can then become a blessing to others. I want to encourage you to just maybe bow your head and close your eyes for just a second and just ponder for a moment here. What is the condition of your life? What kind of fruit is being produced? Maybe are you a little overwhelmed, maybe stressed out? Like you're 23 and you got some white hair already. It's like, man, somebody needs to chill. What kind of fruit is being produced? Pressure happens, y'all. It happens. Let me just pray this over us real quick. Lord, I thank you so much. Thank you for your goodness. Jesus, I thank you that you are the vine. We're the branches. You're the root system, and we want to be grounded in you. We want to be connected to you. God, we don't want to just live life and try to perform and act in such a way where or somehow, some way, you're impressed by our actions and behavior. God, more than that, we want to be grounded and rooted in you so that you can produce your fruit in and through us. Lord, today, we again empty ourselves of us, and we say, God, have your way in us. Not our will, but your will be done, God. Forgive us for our stubbornness. Forgive us for perhaps our distractions and our selfishness from time to time. God, we don't want to do things our own way. We want to be submitted fully to you. God, I pray that you would come and that you would continue to produce that good fruit in us. God, I pray that you would encourage people today. Those that were like branches that got disconnected. God, I pray that today the branches would be reconnected. Those that were distant from God today, Lord, I pray that you would connect us to you again. And God, that we would sense your support, that we would sense your life flow through us. God, I thank you that you're for us. You're not against us. You come and you pursue us.